What's up, gang? Welcome to The Greatness Machine. I'm your host, Darius from Shaw's Day. I'm so pumped to have you here with me. Now listen, The Greatness Machine, we're about two things. Number one, people who are living their passions. And number two, those who are creating greatness in the world and doing both of these things despite the odds against them. Each episode, we're going to feature interviews with game changers, business leaders, you know, telling us their origin stories, what made them tick, what got them to where they are now. Why? So it can help you step into your greatness within your life, your business, and your career. Occasionally, you might hear a few solo episodes from myself, moi, as I say, as I leverage my 20 years of entrepreneurship as a CEO and founder to help you grow and level up in your journey to scale your life and your business. So come be a fly on the wall, enjoy the conversation, and I'm stoked to have you here with me. Guys, welcome to this episode of The Greatness Machine. I'm your host, Darius Machazi, and boy, do we have special guests. My man, Clay Bear is in the house. What's up, Clay? How you doing, Darius? You said my name perfectly, and nobody does that, so you're the best. Oh, man. The best part is you, ta- you taught me before the show. <laughs> <laughs> I got to tee it up, man. Got it. Otherwise, it's Herbert. People buy an extra. I'm like, where'd you get the extra R, Vanna White? I was like 10 seconds away from calling him Herbert, and he's like, hey, do you, do you... We should go over my last name. When your name, now, you know, the listeners know when, when your last name is Mershaz Day, you really want to get last names correct because everyone yeah. fucking just, just absolutely just murders my last name in the wrong way. Oh, uh, man. Yeah. Welcome to have you. Dude, I'm pumped to have you here, my brother. Good, I'm good stoked to, you on to be the here. Show. I love your podcast. I love what you're doing. And yeah, I was, I was so glad to reconnect. I remember meeting what we met at the, the scribe workshop, right? Yeah, man. Can't wait to talk about that. Do you mind yeah. if I do a little bit of housekeeping and then we'll uh, we'll jump into our, our uh, beginnings and endings? Let's Does that do, work? Let's do it. Let's do it. All right, man. So uh, for listeners, we, we got a bunch of new listeners here. For new listeners to the show, Greatness Machine, we're about two things. We're all people living their passions and those creating greatness and doing so despite the odds. My main man, Clay, is neither short of passion nor greatness. So um, before I go into your formal bio, I just want to like start by kind of, t- you teed it up a little bit a second ago, but, but Clay and I met. Uh, about it was like March of 2019. So shit, dude, that was like was that four years ago? It was four years ago. Yeah, yeah. Time flies because it was right before the world shut down, right? It was. Yeah, it was literally like about a year before COVID smacked us in the yeah. face. Um, yeah. So we were. So we did a, a program that I've mentioned on the show before called Guided Author through Scribe. So uh, some people might know Scribe Media as like it used to be called Book in a Box. That's Tucker Max's uh, company that he started. Um, I can't remember his business. His former business partner. Uh, not Javon, but the other dude, uh, um, Zach O'Bront. Yeah, Zach, Zach O'Bron. That's right. So him and Zach started the business, uh, became Scribe Media. Javon McCormick became their CEO. He's now the the owner, crushing it over there. Um, and but we met uh, four years ago in a program called Guided Author, which is the, the so a lot of people that know Scribe, they're like, oh yeah, yeah, that's like where you hire a ghostwriter and they you know they they you know partner with you and you know they they take your words and they convert it to a book. And and it, most people don't know this. They have this badass program for badasses like Clay and myself where you want to where you have to write your own book. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> so so we met in that um and and I was like, man, I knew you and Tucker knew each other. Is that correct? Mm-hmm. You guys had background before yeah. that? So yeah, uh, I've known Tucker for probably 10 years or so. And uh, yeah, he was launching Guided Author and wanted uh, me to sit through it and kind of experience it. And that's where, that's where you and I met. It's a really great program for people to, yeah, if you're not going to hire Scribe to do the full package and you want to still write your own book, it's sort of like the CrossFit for getting your book done. Yeah. So, uh, and I remember like we sat across from each other, but, but you know, you're kind of in your own world in that program because you're like focused on writing your book and you, you know, you kind mm-hmm. of meet people a little bit, but I was like, man, that kind of seems really interesting. And then fast forward, South by Southwest, four years later, we're at a, we're at a, a party. We run into each other. And, and man, next thing you know, you're at my Persian New Year party. And here we are today, <laughs> my friend. So yeah, glad to have well, you. Well, Austin's the center of the universe now, right? So uh, all the collisions the that happen in Austin, right? Tip of the spear, yeah. baby. So you, you left. Um, I want to go over your formal bio in a second, but you sure. left California to come, come to Austin. Is that correct? Yeah, I've been here for just over two years. Two years, April of 2021. Um, decided to finally, along with, we just got a ride on the shuttle bus of all the other people moving from California to Austin. You know, there's so many of us. <laughs> uh, so we booked a flight on the shuttle and uh, yeah, we came here. I, the community here, as you know, uh, really well is just infinite. Like so many people here. And then in the last five years, so many more people have moved here that it's just such a powerful, awesome community, both entrepreneurial and then just everything else right real businesses mom and pop big companies everything 
Yeah, it's it's it really is a a, a special place. I I think like places like like here. I, I always compare here to like San Francisco twenty five twenty twenty five years ago. Um, yeah, and I don't know if everyone will agree agree with that. And if you don't, you can go fuck yourself. But um, <laughs> but uh, I. <laughs> I, I mean, I, I lived there, man. It was a place that, that drew the right, like a really incredible talent pool, like uh, interesting people. And if you, and it's been that way there uh, probably up until recently. Um, yeah. And I, and I felt that same magnetism here in Austin where I was like, oh man, this is, this is, this is like, there's something here. Like, you know, mm-hmm. I, I can't put my arms around it, but, but I know I want, I want to be a part of it. So man, I'm glad you're here. Um, if you don't mind, I'm going to do your formal bio and then uh, we can go yeah. into your origin story. Is that you down, sure. you down for that? Sounds great. Awesome. <clears throat> Perfect. Um, so, Clay a bear, a Clay a bear. I want to make sure Perfect. I get that right. Perfect. Oh, you nailed it. Dude, I'm crushing it today. Clay a bear, man. For a decade, Clay led teams at Accenture, so that you've worked with some of the biggest Fortune 500 companies. You're profiled in uh, Tim Ferriss's Tools for Titans, a book I love. Entrepreneur You by Dory Clark, and Deep Work by Cal Newport, which I'm actually in the middle of reading right now. Um, you've helped um, over. It's funny 2000- you just mentioned my name on that. They they type my name Herbert in the printed book and probably in the audio book too. So use that a better than Cal Newport's book. Yeah. You know, Cal get with your fucking program, bro. Come on. Like, <laughs> like, like, it's please not deep pronunciation, on. right? Yeah. Yeah. Deep working his last name properly. Um, <laughs> so man, you've worked on tons of projects, totaling over, raising over a hundred million dollars in crowdfunding. I know you have a lot of experience there and I'm, I'm going to be excited to talk a little bit about that. And you're recently named one of entrepreneur magazines, 50 most daring entrepreneurs along with Jeff Bezos and Elon Musk. We're going to be talking about uh, your newest project, uh, Take Back Perfect. You're the founder of that, as well as some story math, man. I can't wait to get into it. Yeah. So how'd I do? For sure. Did I, did I, did I get that okay? Perfect. Oh, Perfect. Money. I need to hire you as my, uh, as my PR person to walk around with. <laughs> I'll have like a big uh, uh, like microphone, uh, me- megaphone. So, but you know, man, here at the, orig- uh, here at the uh, Greatness Machine, we love origin stories. You know, I, I, yeah. I, I think a big part for me is, A, I'm super inquisitive of like, well, how'd you get to where you got to? I'm sure you didn't wake up when you were like 12 and say like, I can't wait to do all these cool things with businesses and, you know, making the world different in this really interesting way. Uh, no one grows up saying they want to work at Accenture, except if your mom works at Accenture. So right. I, I know that we all kind of get to where we get to in these like kind of circuitous ways. Um, do, give us kind of the origin story. I, mean, I want to hear a little bit about that. Yeah, for sure. When I was really young, I grew up in a small town, Eau Claire, Wisconsin. And when I was pretty young, my first like nugget of learning anything to do with sort of marketing, sales, persuasion, any of this stuff. I was freezing my butt off, taking the candy bars, the overpriced, you know, at this, at the time it was like $1. Now they're probably $3. The fundraiser candy bars that you do for elementary school. And I would go up to the little grocery store, our little tiny grocery store in our hometown. And I would be a little, you know, salesman outside, try to sell candy bars. And what I realized after freezing my butt off and selling a few here and there, what I realized it had nothing to do with the candy bar and it had nothing to do with the wrapper or even really the sales pitch. It was more about the customer who is the kind of person who buys a candy bar from a kid who's freezing his butt off outside the grocery store. And so I took that little nugget and maybe a little unethical. We'll see. But like I brought my brother's clothes in a duffel bag and once like I would watch it and once like five or six of the types of families that would buy a candy bar from a kid freezing walked in, I would go around the thing, change the hat, change the clothes, change the coat, you know, you'd, it's Wisconsin in the winter, so you're bundled up, can't even see the kid anyway. And I would go to the exit door, which is the other side of the building, and sell candy bars to the same people on the way out. So that was my first <laughs> sort of like, you know, I don't, I didn't write it in a Evernote or anything at the time, right? It was just like, oh, they're buying it because of who they are, not because of what I'm selling or my sales pitch. But then years later, yeah, my, my dad was an entrepreneur. He had a furniture store. It didn't really work out. And I saw my dad, he, he was very smart, very hardworking. And so I was like, well, entrepreneurship is risky because if dad is smart and hardworking and it didn't work out, then entrepreneurship is the problem, not, you know, marketing or my dad or whatever. So I went, me and both my other brothers went full on corporate. I was corporate at Accenture for 10 years. And about halfway through that, I was working in between two different Accenture projects, flying through O'Hare airport. And they were, I was like running late for my flight. They're calling my name. And I needed a book to read on the next leg of my flight. My client work was done, so I'd read a business book. It was always like Jack Welsh, fire the bottom 20% kind of business books. And I ran into Hudson News, and there was this weird-looking purple book that had a cow print on it. And I'm from Wisconsin, so that one kind of jumped off the shelf. I'm like, all right, I don't know what it is. Grab it, go. And I read Seth Godin's Purple Cow on that plane ride, and it like 
blew my brains against the airplane window of like, this is how I think about marketing and, you know, innovation and creativity and leadership and business and stuff like that. So I went home, subscribed to the rest, subscribed to his blog, ordered the rest of his books and just devoured and went down the Seth Godin rabbit hole. And this is like back in 2003 or 2004. And then for four or five years, tried to bring that kind of thinking inside of Accenture. And they were like, that's adorable, but we do, you know, our tagline at the time was innovation delivered. And I thought I found like 50% of it, the innovation part that Accenture wasn't good at. And they were sort of like, no, we just do the delivered part. We help companies implement Oracle or SAP or whatever it is. And so I, uh, over the, over the next few years, tried to bring creative thinking inside of Accenture. Um, they weren't really about it. So in 2008, I got a chance to leave Accenture and study with Seth Godin. So that was my big, like leave the first career control, I'll delete. And I got a chance to spend six months in Seth Godin's office with him kind of learning from the master and completely like reset my career. Um, started over, started at zero clients, zero revenue, kind of that big, uh, you know, pivot that some of us make over the time. And, uh, and then, yeah, hung out a shingle and started helping individuals initially authors and then smaller companies and then bigger companies with branding and marketing. And that's still what I do today. It's, it's evolved a bit, like you said, perfect intro and story math, uh, as far as the specific offerings, but it's really about helping individuals and brands and companies figure out the best version of their story and then sort of how and where and when to tell that. I love that, man. You're going to, you're going to be, um, pumped right now because uh you are actually beating seth to the punch on being on the show by four weeks he's coming on the show oh. four weeks from today nice yeah nice i'm not and i don't know him i've never met him before um and i actually haven't I, i'm not a, a marketer so i haven't read his books but um he has a new book coming out um that's uh with penguin yeah uh, next month and so he's coming here as part of his book tour book launch tour nice so. it, everything so. i mean for anyone listening, if anything you do touches marketing, humans, persuasion, or anything, just read everything Seth's ever written. A good place to start is his book. Uh, if you want to go down the rabbit hole of marketing specifically, he did write an orange book called This Is Marketing. And it's kind of like his greatest hits box set. A lot of his books over the years were going deep on one particular topic, like Purple Cow was about how to make a remarkable product. This Is Marketing is sort of like the greatest hits box set of the marketing stuff. And then his last few books have been more about creativity if you've read like Stephen Pressfield's the war of art um his I book love the practice that's book the practice was kind of more it would be shelved next to you know the war of art as far as like getting our creative work out of us like the uh the recent book from um who's the music producer in california Rick rubin i just Rick i rubin, just yeah. finished the book i literally just finished that book three days ago creative act yeah so that's the that war of art and seth's latest work are all those would be shelved next to each other so yeah incredible seth is the best Dude, you just pumped me up because I literally f just finished. I, I'm going to read the, the book you just said by Seth because I just finished. I've been on this like kick around like it, it's really interesting. If you start to look at those books like Steve Pressfield's book, the, the War of Art, the Creative Act, and you actually overlay that with like Dave Goggins, can't, right. can't, can't hurt me. They, they, they like they I think I kind of see them as very similar books. I, what do you, what sure. do you think about that? That's a really interesting insight. I'd never really thought about that. I kind of think, yeah, it's like one is almost to sit back on the couch and like understand the importance and the power of getting your work out there. And then what do you, what do you need next? You need a little, you know, who's going to carry the boats, a little David, David Goggins screaming in your ear to actually get it done. Yeah. That, I love that one, two punch. Cause you know, the war of art and the others are almost a sort of like, I almost think of it as like a, a passive, like get into your head, creativity, the power, the importance of this stuff. And then that's like the, the importance in the strategy. And then the Goggins is like, let's do it. Like, let's go. So, so I, I, I agree with that. I'm going to add one more nugget of how I saw it, which was yeah. one is the creative can't hurt me. And the other is the physical version of can't hurt me. And this, and Perfect. meat in the middle is the psychology of like not quitting and trying and pushing yourself beyond your limits, both creatively and physically. Yeah. Um, and it all, that. And it all, the middle ground psychology, right. Of both of those. Mm -hmm. And also like you make a great point. One thing I've found over the years, cause it's always like one thing I think, you know, sets books and the, the practice and the war of art and those kind of things. Um, teach you is like, I, I hate all the morning routine stuff. It, it's fine. But like how, how many morning routines do you got to look at before you're just using, you know, trying to craft the perfect morning routine as a place to hide versus like 
sure, it's good to have routines. It's good to have habits now. Go figure out yours. And there's no right one. There's no perfect answer. Like, go figure out your morning routine. And I think with one thing I've figured out over time, I learned this from my friend Jim Quick, when your body moves, your your brain grooves is one of his little sayings, right? And so when you go on a walk, if you've got your little voice recorder or your notes or whatever, if you're stuck, if you're jammed, you know, sometimes sitting in an office with lighting and a blinking cursor is not the most creative space. There's a reason why companies have offsites and they don't hold their most creative quarterly meeting in the same meeting. They do the, the Monday morning status, right? Um, change of pace, change of scenery, change of music, change of environment. Some people use substances, right, to, to unlock their brain and whatnot. So I think that's that that overlap of like the physical and the creative is like, what do you need to do physically to do that? I challenge anyone, if, if you're listening to this and you're in any way, feel like you have writer's block or any sort of creative block, just go walk on a treadmill at like three miles an hour, uh, maybe throw it on a little incline and just have some, whatever you want to do, iPad, notepad, something, or just a, just a phone to speak into. I almost guarantee if you just sit there and walk slowly for an hour or go, go for a walk outside, even better, um, more ideas will come to you for sure. I love that, man. Yeah. I, I you know, it's funny is like, I'm kind of an idea monkey as my yeah. friend calls himself and I stole it from him. I'm like, I'm such an idea monkey. I, we, we had a uh, James Altucher on the show. Um, uh, do you know James? Are you buddies with him? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. So he's funny, right? So like, like, uh, a, he's the, the quirkiest dude, but I, I, I love him, man. Like, he, like, yeah. I really think he's an interesting guy and he has this whole For thing sure. around like ideas, idea sex and how do you come up with mm -hmm. more ideas? And, mm -hmm. um, and he, he actually he treats it like a muscle, right? Like how yeah. do you build the muscle of, of idea creation, which I think, you know, and I think that they all kind of come into the same play play, which is whether you're moving your body, pushing yourself physically pushing yourself mentally to like just ex ex vomit ideas it's about i think it's around like what steve pressfield says which is kind of like butting up against resilience and like continuing to push through you know despite yeah. the resilience which i love the way he talks about it um, yeah. so i love all the stuff you're talking about i have a question for you though first yeah. of all i want to take three steps back um i love your story about standing in front of the grocery store and double double dipping on the sale um i want to <laughs> i feel I wanna... a little bad but that's like i said that's when i figured out it's more about the person than it wasn't it wasn't my little eight-year-old sales pitch it was like oh these people take pity on a freezing eight-year-old yeah i mean well i'm a, I, first of all i want to up i want to i want to give you a little nugget of info they are still selling those candy bars for a buck just so you know um, oh good i, I, I assume sold... with inflation those things would be you know <laughs> they're still yeah, overpriced with it the... They should be three bucks. Like you're yeah. right because you can't get a dollar candy bar in the store now. That's two fifty for a Snickers. So, so yeah, yes, right. I agree with you. But I like just so you know, I just bought twenty of them. It cost me twenty bucks um, for go. my kids' choir. Um, but I made him go sell them to people. I'm like, I'm like, dude, listen, man, I had to go door to door. You got to learn the art of like making people feel bad for you to buy your candy. That's dude, that's like, I appreciate it. Like I, I hate the, uh, you know. Some some little girl wins the the Girl Scout cookie competition because her mom at IBM like did the email all and set up seventeen state like did all the work for her and robbed the the best thing about Girl Scout cookies, which is teaching little girls to be entrepreneurs. Right? And I'm gonna tell you this right stole. now, man. I came in second place every fucking time to those girls, <laughs> and and I was the one whose parents didn't have my my dad was a was an entrepreneur owned gas stations and my mom was a social worker and an introvert. They sold yeah. a grand total of zero fucking candy bars for me um, exactly. ever. And yeah. I swear to God, I came in second place every time. And I was the kid out there grinding the streets at nine yeah. years old, raising money for my school for like a little, like, like uh, literally the prizes were garbage. I, I, I it's, it's, it is kind of fucked up. I mean, unless the school mm -hmm. gets all the money, which, uh, but, but like, I, I think, I think you're dead on, which is straight up Angela Duckworth grit. Like yeah. you are doing your kids zero favors. I told my son, I'm like, I'm, I'm not, I actually lied. I, I bought them from him and told, I, I did not buy them from him with the intention of us keeping them. So I guess mm -hmm. I told half the story. I said, Hey, I'll buy them from you just so your school gets the money, but you have to sell them or else you owe me all the money back. Mm -hmm. and, and it was with it. And it was purely with what you just said. I'm like, dude, kids, like you don't do your kids any favors by doing their work for them. I just don't think, yeah. I, I just don't see it. I, you're teaching them, hey, bud, when you have something hard that you don't know how to do or don't like to do, just come here. Dad will do it for you and wipe your ass because you're not capable of figuring it out for yourself. Like, that's a problem. Like, what are your thoughts on this? I mean, you wouldn't climb down from the bleachers 
in your kid's little league game and try to hit a home run for him as a 40 year old person. You know what I mean? You got to let them strike I, out. I hope let not. Him, yeah. I hope <laughs> not, right? those same people know you got to let them fail. I think, and I imagine I don't have kids yet and hopefully soon, but uh, I imagine that letting them fail is hard. But when you understand this larger thing and, and be able to look at the, like, do you want a 30 year old who's dependent on you and doesn't know how to do things or, uh, do you want an independent kid? Yeah. Baby or kid when they're a baby, when they're three months old, and like give them food and give sure. them what they need and hug them and all that stuff. But then when they can be independent, like let them be Seth, actually back to Seth Godin, he has a great term. He said, I was a free range kid. You know, we talk about free range chickens who are allowed to roam. And he talks about how he was glad he was a free range kid and his parents allowed it, him to do all these things and kind of figure it out. Yeah, yeah, I'm with you. By the way, I, my kids, you, you will listen to this because you'll probably listen to all this stuff when I'm dead one day. Um, I love watching you guys be disappointed, knowing it's making you a better human being. And what I tell my kids is, it, 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 to your point, I go, look, I don't care how well you do. I just care that you tried your hardest. That's all I care mm-hmm. about. Like you yeah. can fail. Failure is part of life. And you know, like if you're not failing, you're not winning, right? Yeah. And, and it means you're not trying hard enough. You're not putting yourself out there enough. And failure is just learning, you know, as, as, as I can't remember who said that, but failure, failure being learning is, I love that idea. Um, you just, going to, you like, just hit like, on something interesting. Something popped into my head when you said that, because I think you and I are both probably against the, uh, you know, the trend of like participation trophies and everybody gets the same oh. trophy and everything else. But what you said about like Angela Duckworth and grit, we shouldn't all get participation trophies, but kids that try, even if they're smaller genetically than the big football player or whatever, they try hard. There, there should be grit trophies, right? Like we know based on totally. who you are, where you were, like here's the grit trophy. And I think that'd be really interesting. That just popped in my head when you said that. Yeah. As, our, as, as, as the great Charlie Munger says, you show me someone's uh, incentives, I'll show you their actions. Right. And, and, and sure. I feel like we, we, we don't do those things. So um, I wanted to kind of move into this, you know, this realm because, because really you, you've taken this love of marketing and really explored a lot of different areas you know, from crowdfunding to helping people really find their voice in, in, in a lot of different areas of the business world and created a ton of value. Tell us a little bit about that. I mean, once you hooked up with Seth and kind of got geeked out on the marketing, what did you, what did you go with that? And, and how did you, like, what was your thought process? Like, hey, I'm going to start doing consulting again, because obviously you had this big consulting background. Tell us a little bit about that story. Yeah, for sure. And yeah, it was 2009 and Obama's first day was our first day with Seth Godin. And then the six months just flew by the structure of the program was like show up Seth would even cook his breakfast and then he it, the the pace and the velocity of learning was just a hundred times your typical sort of uh, school system or public education it'd be a new topic a new thing he'd be like uh, let's discuss it let's read about it and then immediately you know m- midway through we're actually applying that knowledge by like mid-morning we'd have quick lunch and then in the afternoon we would do a group project to like implement what we learned in the morning so when that project ended, again, like I said, I was starting over zeros across the board, um, hung out a shingle and started. I got, my first client was actually a guy named Sebastian Younger, who's a really, really, really amazing guy. He wrote a book called The Perfect Storm that became the movie with George Clooney and Mark Wahlberg. Yeah. Um, and then subsequently wrote a book called War and made a movie called Restrepo. And then he wrote one of the best books, uh, Tribe. Check out Tribe. It's funny. Seth Godin wrote Tribes. Years later, Sebastian Younger wrote Tribe, but it's all about tribes across the world, but specifically sort of the military. So I hung out a thing. He he was an amazing author. He'd already written Perfect Storm, won all these awards, and was just this incredible author, but had no online presence, no website. Um, When you Googled his name, it went to some other weird site. So I built SebastianYounger.com, and we built it as a community site. You're you're a tech guy back in the day. You remember Ning, N-I-N-G? We built it as a community site where if you if you read the book and you resonated with one of the soldiers, we built an email address where you could actually email um, the site. It would come to me. I'd validate, make sure they weren't a crazy person and then forward it on to the soldiers. So imagine reading like a Malcolm Gladwell book and you're like, Oh my gosh, that guy he talks about in the Maven chapter. And then you can email and get connected with that person. So that's what I built. Um, And then, yeah, then started helping. That was my first dollar of revenue after the Seth program. Uh, got connected with Sebastian's agent through Seth and then built that website. And then I've just always loved books and marketing too. So over the years I've done stuff with books, but then it was um, smaller companies and then bigger companies. And then, and then in 2013 is when I blew my intro to Matt Mullenweg and that was kind of the domino that started perfect intro. 
Wait, 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 wait. So, so hold on. So I got two questions. So, yeah. because I, I don't know what you just said. I don't know the history of that. I want to know more, but before I go there, okay. going back to, so, so you got, a, you did a six month, like university class with, with Seth Godin being the master teacher. How many people were in the program with you? There was 10 accepted. And then one woman had some uh, issues with like a Canadian visa. And I think also a boyfriend. So there ended up being nine of us in the program. So nine of us sat around the table in Seth's office and, in, in north of new york city is about 45 minutes north of the city um and yeah i got to monday through friday all day he would he would leave about 3 p.m in the afternoon because by that point he'd given us you know a month's worth of stuff to do and think about in a day and then the very next day we'd be on to another another topic it wasn't like you know the problem with our current education system there's lots of them but like oh we're gonna learn management accounting for 12 weeks it's like three months of your life to learn one topic out of a textbook and with him it was like new topic on monday do it boom project and then maybe the next day we'd review the group project we did the prior day on to the next topic like we might learn everything you need to know about typography in a day and then the next day we'd be on to something else and and, and if you don't mind my asking like yeah would you have to pay for the, you have to pay for this no so it was free you uh we didn't have to pay seth we just had to get to new york and basically free up our calendars and be able to show up for six months, you know, Monday through Friday. So I left Accenture, you know, to be able to do that. So he, so see, he, so I mean, that's kind of brilliant on his part, right? He's like, he gets a Accenture tenure, Accenture trained, uh, like consultant, which is probably a couple hundred grand a year job. I'm guessing minimum and to come work for free for him to, and, 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 and which by the way, like he's getting a ton of value. You're getting a ton of value. So I'm not saying you didn't, you obviously got to work with this badass. Um, and it's almost like an apprenticeship, if you will. Is that, am I thinking about that the right way? It, so it's interesting. The Forbes article, Forbes did a piece on this program in like 2009. And it was a pretty bad piece, to be honest. But it was called The Apprentices. Um, not a really well-crafted piece. But we weren't really working for Seth. Part of that was part of the initial structure. And then once we got there and learned from him and stuff like that, he's like, you don't have to work on my projects. Just work on your own projects. So it was oh, not cool, only okay. do we have to pay him. We basically just learned. He did subsequent programs after that where he truly sort of hired people like the Domino Project. He built like a little publishing house for a year or two, um, published like 12 books in 24 months or something like that, proved something crazy. Um, and he did other, like the Alt MBA eventually grew into and became a real business that then he spun off to a B Corp called Akimbo. Um, but that's where he sort of hired people and had them come to the office and truly work for him. This was literally just our benefit, learning from the master and then applying that to our own projects. That's amazing. So if I, if I was asking you, what's the number one thing you learned from him? Like the biggest thing where you're like, this is like the biggest nugget that I took out of that six month program. What would, what would that have been? Yeah, it's interesting. There's um, what I would say, if anyone wants those kinds of nuggets, go get the orange book. This is marketing because that's like the role. And that, and that book came out, what, eight, nine years after we did the program. And that really is the greatest hits. Um the there's so many little nuggets and i swear every single week one of them will pop up and it's like sets voice on my shoulder of like i'm working with a client and they're like oh this or that or whatever there's a few big ones one is choose your customers choose your future like when people start to think about a new thing they start to think about the app they want to build or the whatever and you and i know like you can choose any customer you want but if you choose the east hampton vineyard vines hedge fund crew you're going to have a different calendar and different meetings and different types of interactions and everything else versus if you choose creatives in Miami or, you know, whatever. So like start with who is your customer really when you're building or starting anything, like really get into it. You know, we all know about customer avatar stuff, but forget the demographics, forget the age, the the sex, the whatever. Think about how they feel, uh, their problems, fears, hopes, and dreams and start with that. And no matter what you're starting understand that starting with your customer informs everything people are like how much should i charge i'm like well that depends who are you charging i was talking to a friend literally yesterday good example he's talking about how to price his services and he's like i have a real problem getting my prices over this amount i said well that's because you reached this kind of customer that's who we built his audience around is sort of people who want free content on instagram i'm like of course you have a problem charging but if sure. you go to Coca-Cola and try to charge what he thinks is the highest rate, Coca-Cola will think there's a zero missing because they're used to paying a lot more. So 
everything starts with uh, your customer and that, that informs the structure, your calendar, your interactions, you're going to have your marketing, your voice, your tone, everything. I love that, man. So fast forward. So, so you left the program and you, you, and I, I wasn't, I didn't, I don't know the person you, you spoke of that really where things blew up in your favor to mention, talk about that again. Sebastian Younger. No, author. after him. No, after, um, after Sebastian, after you did the work with Sebastian, you oh, said that when I, there... when I screwed up my intro. So I went to a Jim quick conference in yeah. 2013 and a uh, Jim has become a dear friend over the years. And they said, uh, they said the speakers are going to be interesting, but the attendees, like it's going to be a really interesting conference and cool people. So after the first, first speaker was great. And then like every conference after the first speaker, there's a break where you meet the person next to you. They said, yeah, introduce yourself to the person next to you. So I turned and I did for whatever reason that day, I had this kind of long rambling drawn out introduction. I covered probably where I grew up in Wisconsin and selling candy bars in the cold and everything else. And, uh, and the guy I was meeting, he told me who he was and he was Matt Mullenweg, the creator of the founder of Automatic, the creator of WordPress that powers about a quarter of the internet or oh. a fifth of the internet. Wow. And I knew who Matt Mullenweg was. He was sort of like one of my geeky tech heroes, right? But I didn't, he, he looked a little bit different and I didn't know exactly what he looked like. So there's this picture, thankfully for me, there's this picture of me meeting Matt Mullenweg, shaking his hand and, and literally having this face of like, like <laughs> I meet it, like I recognize who he is. And so I initially I walked away from that interaction just being like, oh, you, you remember those old uh, Chris Farley SNL skits where he's like, oh, so stupid. Like when you meet your hero and like mm -hmm. blow it. Yeah. So that's how I felt like Chris Farley afterwards. I'm like, how do I not? I think I skipped the next speaker and I'm walking around this beautiful conference area just being like, okay, champ, how do you never screw up your intro that? Because you just met the guy who powers a quarter of the internet and had the dumbest introduction possible. And so oh, I kind of figured I Googled, you know, you get the elevator pitch and all these stupid things and I Googled it. And then I kind of thought about, okay, marketing, messaging, storytelling, what's a better way to do this. And I still never thought it would be a business. And then about six months later, I taught it to some friends in New York city. My friend, Andy Elwood, uh, asked if I would come speak to his group of startups at a WeWork on a Saturday in New York city. And I was like, sure. So I went and I taught the perfect intro, a few other things too. And that like seven of the 12 startups emailed me and they said, Oh, I finally, like my investor finally understands what I do, or I was able to close my round or whatever. And I was like, oh, it was that idea radar of like, maybe there's something there. And then I kind of dipped the, dipped the candle in the wax another few times, taught it at the next thing, taught it at the next thing. And pretty much I've been teaching that, um, since about 2013. So, or maybe 2014. So coming up on nine or 10 years. And now that's the main keynote and speech that I give. So I'll go to companies. Let's say a company has a thousand people. That means a million times a year, one of their employees gets asked, so what do you do? And so they don't usually answer that very well, right? I'm a senior vice president at, at IBM or I'm a whatever, I'm a community right. manager at Airbnb. That doesn't help that person. It doesn't help you and it doesn't help the person you're talking to. So I created this framework that allows you to get into the story of what you do and who you help and the story of your customers that you help. And then, so I'll give the speech and then work with companies to figure out their best version of their perfect intro. So take Scribe, a company it, that you and I both know well. Right. If someone says to a Scribe employee at a cocktail bar, on an airplane, wherever, so what do you do? What most people would say is, well, I work for Scribe. It's a different kind of publishing company or something like that, right? Or I'm a VP at a publishing company or whatever. That doesn't do any good. So I worked with Tucker. Tucker's very good at this kind of stuff too. And Scribe's perfect intro is, um, so we turn books into, or sorry, we turn ideas into books and leave it at that. And then just shut up. That's, you don't have to make it complete. You don't have to make it too accurate. We turn ideas into books. Well, now think of the person talking, they didn't know what Scribe was. And if you say, I'm a manager at Scribe, I'm a blah, 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 your role, your title, your company, who cares? We turn ideas into books. Well, anyone you're talking to has had an idea and some people, some of them, have thought, what if my idea was a book, right? So now you've opened the conversation. Mm. Someone might say, what do you mean? Or how do you do that? And then that person can choose any number of case studies. You could go Goggins, right? Goggins worked with Scribe. You'd be like, have you heard of a guy named David Goggins? Half the right. country has, half the country hasn't maybe. Um, and then you could tell the Goggins story, or you could say Joey Coleman or any other person who's worked with Scribe, Todd Herman. 
and tell the story of them and their book. And like, there's Joey Coleman is this amazing, incredible speaker. And most speakers have a book and Joey didn't have a book. So he finally decided it was time to package up his amazing speeches. And now he's doing this many more gigs at a higher fee, blah, 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 blah. So that's what we do. So the, the, the high level structure and I'm happy, let's do, I'll create a, a really cool freebie for your folks at like clay and Darius.com. I'll give them a whole perfect intro thing, but the high level framework is shorter and sweeter upfront. And then it's okay if it's a little complete and the person goes, so what do you mean? Or how do you do that? Then you go, let me tell you a story and then tell them a story of your client or your customer and the transformation that they went through. So the simple framework for that is when so-and-so first found me, when Darius first came to us, whatever, they're 90% amazing, incredible. They're your client before they found you is amazing. They were just missing this one little thing and you helped them fill in that last 10% of the circle. And now they're off to the races because they have the whole thing. So that's what I do. That's kind of the, the framework or structure. So, so I love that. It's like this, like, I mean, I would call it an elevator pitch because it's even tighter than that, right? The elevator pitch is like 10 words or less. It's like, this is like five words. And, I'm, and, and I'm I position against the elevator you. pitch because you're never, it's, it's a made up construct. It still gets taught because it's like a clever title. You're never going to pitch right. your business in an elevator. You and I have been in a lot of elevators and I don't imagine we've ever been in one with Richard Branson where you got to pitch your business before. If you ever do, nope. first of all, probably never going to happen. But if you ever do get in an elevator, it might happen with Richard Branson. He doesn't want to be hard pitched. He wants you to say something interesting and clever in a confident way where he's like, I got to run, but you should come to Necker Island and tell me more about that. Like that, the real elevator pitch isn't a pitch at all. It's imagine how George Clooney would deliver that line to say, we teach people how to meditate at gunpoint. That's one of the perfect intros that I helped a friend create. And think of the open loops that that create. What do you meditate at gun? I don't know. I got to get off the elevator, but we should talk, right? The point is a follow-up, not to close the sale. So that's why the elevator pitch is broken. I love that. So I, I, first of all, I did pitch. Uh, I did get to pitch um, Richard Branson. Nice. And just, uh, yeah, to like, so my business almost Probably not became elevator, virgin. Though, right? No, I was, I was going to make your, I was actually going to like back up what you just said. So if, for anyone that wants to know what it looks like to pitch Richard Branson, I can tell you in a second. So I nice. almost became Virgin Money USA. Oh, wow. Okay. And here's how that really worked. Their investment banker, who happened to be my investment banker, introduced me to his family office and I went to the UK and pitched them. And then they came to Toronto and we had a second meeting and then they decided not to do the deal. That's what okay. pitching Richard Branson looks like, in case anyone ever wants to know. Exactly. Um, he's like, go. dude, he's on Necker hanging out. Like, he doesn't want to be pitched to anything. <laughs> the elevator pitch is you know? trash. If I can recruit your, uh, my, my global vision and goal is to recruit everyone to help me destroy the elevator pitch because it's BS and then do perfect intro instead. I love that. And then the second thing I wanted to ask you um, is I actually had kind of a similar situation where I where I met Elon Musk and it wasn't in oh, an wow. elevator it was at it was at South by in the back of the Moody and it was him Kimball the showrunner for um uh gosh uh Westworld his wife who's his partner and my buddy who was the agent for Jonah Nolan who's Christopher Nolan's brother who does Westworld and me wow. and wow. dude I'm going to say something right now and I want your advice on this I was fucking tongue tied I didn't, it was the first time in my whole life I, I'm like, I don't know what to say because they had just come off stage. Jonah had just interviewed Elon. We're in the back. There's five. It's five of us, it's like five people. And I'm in the circle. And I'm standing right next. Elon's like to my left. And like, stand, he's, by the way, he was really tall because he had cowboy boots on. He was like six five with cowboy boots, which I was surprised by that. And he's super fucking weird and quiet. So that doesn't make the situation any better. Um, and I had nothing to say. I didn't know what to say. I'm like, first of all, I'm, and this was the me mental math I did, which was an interesting thing because I think you would have the same situation if you're in, in an elevator with Richard Branson. I'm like, first of all, he knows I know who he is. So I can't say, right. what's your name? Right. right? What do you like, do? That, you, can't, that, you can't start with, what do you do? Dude, you lose. What do you do? Where are you from? What's your name? All like the, 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 the intros for people that are not like world renowned. Like you don't, you lose those. And I'd never been put in that position before where I was like, a, and a peer circle with someone who are literally every single person knew each other and knew I knew who they were and I didn't know where to go. And so I've asked people this before. I've gotten, uh, I don't know if you know Renee Rodriguez, but I was like, what would you, yeah, what would you do in that? Sure. You know, you know, Renee from Amplify? Yeah. I asked yeah. him, him that question and he gave me a pretty good answer, but I'm, I'm still like always asking people like, 
what would you do in that situation? What do you think with the perfect intro? Well, how would you, if, if you're me, how would you have done that? Because I felt, dude, literally, I had said something super lame, like, how long are you guys in town till? That was my question, yeah. which was, <laughs> was terrible. Crazy weather we're having. They right? said, yeah. Yeah, it was literally one of those because I literally had nothing to say and I didn't, I felt uncomfortable saying nothing because that was weird too. And then they said, oh, we're leaving this afternoon. I'm like, oh, have you guys had barbecue yet? I'm not joking. I said that. It was pathetic. Yeah. And then, and they're like, yeah. And I'm like, where'd you guys get it from? And they're like, look at each other. Like, we don't know. They they brought it to us. And I'm like, and then I shut up. So it was, it was a total dud. I felt terrible for it. And I was like, I will never be put in that position again. So I'd love your feedback on this. Yeah, for sure. Was the context, did they say, so what do you do? Or was it just one of these kind of like green room, small room situations where you were there and they were there? And it was like Jonah and his wife or, or, or agent, my, my really good friend, like came to say hi after the, sh- the show. And I was tagging along with him and we just kind of, no one asked me shit. They didn't even care what mm-hmm. my name was. Um, yeah. So I was just like the, the random dude tagging along with nothing to say. Yeah. So it so, was it wasn't it wasn't a perfect what do you do, but it, right. but it probably could have got there had I like d- said something interesting to get it there. I just had yeah. no, I had no opening line to get there. So here's the best way to solve for that. And this will eventually be in the book when I finally finish the book years years after you finish yours. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's the power of pairs. So let imagine I was there with you, right? And we both know who Elon is but Elon doesn't know who we are. The best way for you to be pitched is not for you to do it. It's for me to do it because I can be like, Hey, Elon, Darius and I are huge fans. Can I tell you about a new thing he's working on or even better tie it to something he cares about? Right? So if you happen to know, and it sounds like maybe this time you didn't know, but if you know, you're going to be in a room with Elon, you know, his thing, you know, whatever, um, what does he care about? What are his, uh, you know, what, what's his current project, et cetera, et cetera. You can hook it into something that he is interested in. He cares about. But if I was there, I, I, you see how I can brag about you in a way that you can't brag about you. That's the key. And here's, so the takeaway for anyone, cause it's probably going to be more likely that you're going somewhere to a party to be introduced. If you and I were going to a party, what is it? Friday here in Austin, say Sunday night, you and I are going to a party. I would pick you up and I, in the car, I would say, Darius, what do you want me to talk about with regard to you right now? Is it the podcast? Is it your new business? Is it whatever? And then as we go around the party, we don't have to stay locked at the hip the whole time. But I'm like, can I tell you about Darius' this new thing? Or it, here's the trigger and the kind of a secret, secret trick for this. If you and I are together at the party and someone goes, oh, so what do you do? I automatically jump in in a very polite way and be like, Darius, can I, can I tell him what you do? This happens all the time mm-hmm. naturally, right? But you just make it intentional. Can I tell him what you do? And you're like, yeah, sure. And then I can gush and break. Like Darius would never say this himself, but he actually, boom, 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 boom. And even better, beforehand on the drive there, you told me the thing that you want me to highlight of all the amazing things that you do. So if you're going to be in another space with somebody, just do a very, it can take five minutes ahead of time. It can be before we walk into this room and be like, all right, Tell, talk about this and this. These are my two things that are front that I, and it might be depending on the context of the people that you're going to see, right? Um, if you and I were going to, if we were in Hollywood and it was a meeting and a cocktail party of screenwriters, I would have a different intro than if it was people who make tech technology, right? Um, I would have you highlight a different thing about me. So if you're going to a party or a place or a place where you might meet Elon, don't introduce yourself, have your friend brag about you. And then at the end, of course, you can return, return the favor. You'd be like, you're so nice, Clay. Clay's, Clay's being modest, but Clay himself is da 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 da, da right? right. Um, that's the power of pairs. It's a really, really simple, powerful trick that's available to anyone. I love that, man. By the way, I'm so pissed we weren't friends when we were both single and not married. Um, cause you <laughs> oh, were right. like the best world, world. I used to call myself the world's best wingman. It sounds like yeah. you, you won, you won that battle. Jesus. I, I'm, um, <laughs> I'm still a good wingman. I don't do it as much anymore, but if I'm ever, I know if any, I have, if any I have listeners too, are in Austin, yeah, yeah. Yeah. If, uh, I'm, I'm great. Cause I've, I'm, I've no like interest cause I'm married, but, but right. I'm like, Oh, I'll make you look good. But yeah, that's yeah. so smart. Right. And, and to your point, like I like the intentionality of it. Cause if, cause really it's like, at back then I was running like a big mortgaging platform. Like he wouldn't give me two shits about a mortgage platform at all. Right. Like right. zero. 
Like that's actually right. the most boring thing that could have been said in that room, right? Right. So right. I think if but you know you're something go that Elon, you were doing at that time, there's something you were doing at that time that would have been interesting to him because you you're a multifaceted person. You've always got a bunch of things going on. You're super interesting, and it might be like about your family or whatever or something else you're doing, right? Another thing I'll give your audience like your intro doesn't have to be your number one core business. That's another thing we get lied to about yeah. the elevator pitches. Pitch your business. No, it could be, yeah, I don't know. I caught the pickleball bug and I've been playing pickleball and I actually just started and I'm now I'm almost a 3.5, 4.0, blah, blah, blah. And Elon might be like, oh, my friend is launching an entire new nationwide pickleball league. Like you can find other interesting nuggets of conversation that aren't your core business. That, here's the thing, and I'll, uh, Darius, it all comes down to creating a human connection and the elevator right. pitch is pretty much the worst at creating a human connection. If you can find a way to you know, me to brag about you to someone like that or to, to anyone really. Um, it's like casting a wide net, telling an interesting story and opening up a bunch of loops. And if you mention pickleball and something else and something else, and the person's not interested in any of those, fine. There's no human connection, but at least, at least give human connection a chance. And the elevator pitch doesn't do that. I love that, man. And, and to your point, like I have a friend, uh, that we were talking cause I, um, starting a private equity fund right now. And I got introduced to this like complete Royal badass in the area that we're trying to do this in. And, and he's a friend of a friend and we, and we, I was like, Hey, I just want to hit him up for some advice and, the, and, and not wanting money or anything like that. And, and, and like now the conversation went to a whole different level where he, where we might partner and it's really interesting. Right. Nice. And my buddy said, listen, when, when you ask for help, you get money. And when you ask for money, you don't get help. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I love that. Like, it's it, what, it, the one the way I heard it was ask for money, get advice, ask for advice, get money. And I, I love that so yeah, much. Yeah. 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 That's sorry. You said it better than me. And, but you made me think about that, which is like, do you roll in and start trying to like pitch Elon? He's not, he's, he's a, everyone wants something from that guy. He knows it. Right. Um, the most powerful people know that people want something from them. The people who can pull the strings, they're looking for the right people that they want to be around, right? They're not, mm -hmm. they're picking the people that they want to spend time with. So when you roll in and go business, they're like, whoa, whoa, guard goes up. I go in and tell them, yeah, I'm like a freaking ukulele fanatic who likes to, you know, make pizzas for the poor. You guys, what do you guys do for fun? Right. Right. That's right. That's a way different conversation. Like, first of all, like I make them think of what are their hobbies, right? We're not even talking about business. And then they, first of all, see that I'm kind of an interesting dude, you know, that has like some interests that are, have nothing to do with the typical shit people are interested in. Yeah, um, exactly. Or at least the professional stuff. Right. Um, so I love that, man. Do you mind if we, I know, I know we're, we're, we're kind of deep in the show. How's your time, by the way, we're, we're supposed to be done in a few minutes, but can you run over or you got a hard yeah, stop? Yeah, of course. No, I'm good. I got all the time in the world for you. All right, cool. Perfect. I got to pick up my son in school in a little bit here, but let's run for like maybe 15, 20 more and then we'll, then we'll, we'll, we'll carve it out. Um, so I want to hear about, um, oh, sorry, let me pull my notes up here. Story math. And I, I think we've kind of been talking about it cause you've been really deep in stories, but is it, tell us about story math. I know it sounds like you've kind of been touching on it already, but tell the listeners about story math. Cause I know that's a big part of everything you do. Yeah. Story math is the concept that we don't buy what we think we buy. If you, I don't know how many people have read the book, Predictably Irrational by Dan Ariely, but it's a little bit like that applied to marketing and branding. So you and I live in Austin. If you and I wanted to go camping on a camping trip, say 12 years ago, we would probably go to Walmart or Target and we would get a Coleman cooler, maybe the five day extreme cooler. And it costs $33, right? And we wouldn't have a problem with, it would be baby blue with a white lid, hinged plastic lid. And the drinks would stay cold. The sandwiches would stay cold. Everything's fine. The cooler works fine. And then a few years later, a brand came along called Yeti and they built literally a billion dollar cooler brand in a space that didn't have a functional product problem. Meaning if our goal of a cooler is a plastic box that keeps our food and drink cold, the Coleman is just fine, right? Nobody had a cooler problem. So how does Yeti come along? And guess what? They didn't make a different color, charge 10% more. A Yeti cooler costs 10 times as much as a Coleman cooler. And the Coleman one isn't even generic. Pre-Yeti, Coleman was the brand. Coleman was the, the cooler brand that you got. So how did Yeti come along and create a product that, that could charge 10 times as much for? Because it's not $33. 
at a zero. It's $330. Well, the only answer is because you're not just buying a cooler. Yes, a Yeti cooler is better than Coleman. I've done the math. It's about three times of a better cooler, you know? So instead of keeping your food cold for seven days, maybe it keeps it cold for 21 days, almost a month. Uh, it's a three times better cooler. So if we're buying a cooler, it should cost a hundred dollars. A Yeti costs $330. So what else are we buying? And that's what story math is all about. You're buying masculinity. You're buying identity. If you have a Coleman, or sorry, you have a Yeti and I have a Coleman, you're buying the ability for when you and I go camping to be like, nice Coleman clay. We'll use my Yeti. Th that sentence alone, right? Th th tell me that doesn't put you at a little bit of a higher status against me. And maybe it's because I beat you in poker last week and we have this banter going back and forth or whatever. So this is everywhere and it's for every product that's not generic white box black aerial if you're not shopping at the dollar store there's a brand and there's a story and that's part of what you're paying for right look at the world of luxury purses etc cetera, etc cetera. hermes bag louis vuitton chanel coach they're all different stories because you can get your makeup from a to b in a plastic heb bag right you're not buying functionality but as humans, we want to be rational. So we want to tell ourselves that what we're buying is functionality. We want to tell ourselves that the Yeti cooler is that much better than a cooler. It's not 10 times better. It doesn't keep your food cold for a whole year, right? Um, and so it's the story. And, and a simple example is just to completely drill it home and prove it is what happens in every Super Bowl com truck commercial that never, ever, ever happens in real life? There's one specific you thing. Go and almost... What's that? Are you go off road? No, because in, in, you and I could go off road in real life, right? We might bounce through the mud a little bit, but you're on the right track. You're definitely headed on the right track. It's it's something even more extreme. Um, shoot, I don't know. Help, help me out. They, they always drop some. It, sometimes it's a bag of cement, but sometimes it's like iron I beams <laughs> or some huge heavy payload. But they don't carefully set it in the back of the truck like you would in real life. They drop it from like right. 20 feet and they're like, Hey Darius, let her go. And for some reason the chains break, like that's how they set things down every time is the chains break. And then the iron eye beams drop in the back of the truck and they zoom in on the shocks and show you that. Yeah. yeah. That doesn't ever happen in real life. Nobody ever drives their brand new $80,000 Ford F-150 to the lot and says, let her go Darius, dump the, no higher, pull it higher, dump the cement from 80 feet in the air. No, never. Yeah. But that's never, what they never. show. Right. And we all just watch it and sip our drink. Like, yeah, yeah, that's real life. Yeah. yeah that's Cause how, when that's you're buying a truck like that, the guys who are on those job sites who move around heavy cement and iron, they don't need a commercial cause they know what truck they buy. Cause they buy the same truck over and over and over. They know what right. truck they like. Some like Chevy, some like for, it's not about getting it right. They have a preference. Who are they selling those trucks to? Guys who don't do that. Guys who don't wear hard hats. Guys who've never dropped a bag of cement or an iron I-beam or who've never climbed a telephone pole. That's They're selling partially masculinity, identity, toughness. You know, It's right in the tagline, built for tough. They're obviously selling toughness, right? So story math is about breaking down psychologically and from a story perspective of the price of a thing how much are you paying for the product and how much are you paying for the story and the identity and what is that story? And so looking at existing products is fine, but also building up with new products. When I work with companies, it's like, okay, you think you're selling a new kind of pan, you know, caraway pans or whatever. What are you really selling? Right. There's a story I learned from Seth, one of the Seth story nuggets back in the 19, gosh, I want to get the decade, right? I think it was the fifties, maybe the sixties. Betty Crocker figured out how to make fully just add water chocolate cake and make it taste really well, right? To powderize and dehydrate and turn into powder all of the ingredients in a chocolate cake. Prior to that, when women made chocolate cake, typically it was women, uh, it was eggs and milk and this and flour and ch cocoa powder and 17 other ingredients, right? And then Betty Crocker figured out how to make it one powder. Sales didn't do well. They, they had trouble selling it because... It was too easy. It was just add water. And that means you're not a good housewife making a cake from, it was too far from being from scratch. So you know what they did? They took out the powdered egg and the powdered milk, and then it was just powder, eggs, milk, and the mix. 
that was enough where you still felt like you're doing something and then sales took off and the rest is history, right? Um, wow. So what's the story there? Priceline, same thing. When you and I search on Priceline or Hipmunk was one of my favorites. That one's gone now. Oh, you know, when you I search for a flight, man. it was the best, right? And what would happen so when you search for Hipmunk? Hitmunk. What happened to Hipmunk, by the way? I think they got acquired. I think Alexis sold it to somebody, but um, so, so, I was so bummed. I'm oh, sorry. I, I digress. No, Go ahead. When Priceline, when you search, there's a little da, 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 or William Shatner or whatever and Hitmonk, the little Hitmonk dance. You know why? They know the prices instantly. Right. That's a fake waiting because when they survey people, they say, oh, the website's working harder for me. You know, they think just like <laughs> taking the egg out of the powder and making you add the egg back in the hard way. Um, you know, in the sixties is like, oh, well now at least the housewife is doing the job of making the brownies. Same thing here. It's like, oh, well the website's working hard. He's looking to the far reaches of the internet for the best. Yeah. Airline. It's literally making you wait. Right. So story math is about when we buy something, what are the, what, what are we actually buying? Cause Seth has this great line, you know, he's able to distill all these amazing things down to just a few words, one of his best. And if you take all of the marketing I've ever learned from Seth and boil it down to a few words. It's people like us do things like this. Cause remember in the beginning we talked about, you have to start with people because different people act different mm -hmm. ways. Who's the people like us and what's the things like this? Because if you're someone who does CrossFit, you might be someone who's open to tough mutter because CrossFit is a place you go. And tough mutter is like CrossFit in a muddy field with fire and things like that. Right. But right. that's different than the Vineyard Vines guys on the, you know, in the Hamptons who their whole life is probably all about comfort and wealth and status and whatever. It's not about getting down in the mud. So story math is really like, what are you buying? And the logo, the swoosh, just do it. Be like Mike, take, take Gatorade. Another one of my favorite examples. Um, for years, their tagline was when, when Jordan was at his peak, right? They would show him on the bench with like blue sweat coming out. Like it was Gatorade. He's literally sweating Gatorade. And the tagline at the right. time, I love the, whoever came up with this, they didn't even beat around the bush that they were literally saying, just be like Mike, but take, yep. be like Mike and expand it into the full sentence of what it would be. If, if we bought products and services completely and not stories, the full line of be like Mike would be dear short white fat kid in the suburbs buy this colored salt water, blue colored salt water, and you'll be a little bit more or a lot more like the greatest basketball player that ever lived. <laughs> like it makes no sense right. if you say the full thing, but if you say, be like Mike sells a lot of Gatorade, that's what that's we're so buying. Funny. And Gatorade sells a lot more than generic Gatorade because there's that many kids who are like, mom pay for the, the good stuff. You know, the purple one, it's, it's what Jordan uses or it's what LeBron uses or whatever. Right. So it's just right. story math is just like applying a number to be like, we all we all buy stories like everything we do is stories and that's why stories matter and that's why you know perfect intro is designed to lead to a story and story math is just about unpacking that i love that man um shoot i you, you know I, I had a question for you and and I, and, I, and i know you have a really cool new project i want to talk about that because i know we're getting near, near the end of the show so so to your point around people buying stories and the like the brands associating their their name with a story. What do you, what do you, have you heard about this Bud Light, Budweiser thing that just happened where they like, yeah. they had like a social media influencer who was LGBT trans and the, like, dude, the, I, the, I think they lost like $3 billion in like market cap over this thing. Like everyone's going fucking crazy. Like, what do you, what do you think about this? It's just one of the biggest mistakes in marketing. And it goes back to what we said at the very top of the show, which is don't just do demographics or whatever about your customer. It was that that was a mistake of not understanding the Bud Light customer and the message and of trying to sort of crowbar or wrench in a particular thing that they wanted to do with the brand. I'm not surprised at all that they lost whatever it was, $3 billion or whatever. It would be like if you, I mean, it would sound absurd to try to start selling Ford F-150s that you drop the iron I-beam in to five-year-old girls. Everyone would be like, five-year-old girls don't buy Ford F-150s. The same thing is true here. That's not the customer now. What's interesting is if they wanted to make the brand more inclusive, more diverse, more reached people, there's actually a really simple way to do it. Here's how I would have done the Bud Light campaign. If the directive was, let's go broader, I would have done a very simple sort of Nike feeling campaign 
where it's like some tagline or something around sharing a beer and connecting with someone like let's grab a beer kind of thing. And it would be pairs of people that aren't typically put together, right? A 16 year old girl and an older black gentleman or whatever, whatever the pairs are of, and they're not 16 year old if they're drinking beer, obviously. Um, but like pairs of, <laughs> I just realized that as I said that I was still thinking about the Ford trucks. Like, 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 oh, that's, that, you, that's, that's shady. <laughs> yeah. But like it, it, almost not, not as on the nose as I'm a Mac, I'm a PC, those ads, but like have the product be the point of connection between two people that maybe wouldn't connect. And that would have accomplished the goals of the campaign of making it more hip, more interesting, more diverse without turning off the core customer of Bud Light. Yeah. That was a hundred percent not knowing who your customer is or honestly just being arrogant about trying to force the brand to become something it's not. They said the brand was in decline for years. It's still the number one beverage that AB and Bev Anheuser-Busch sells. And so I don't think it was in decline. It's still the number one beer. It was one of those sort of like, just don't screw it up. And they screwed it up bad. Yeah, man, I, I that's I I didn't I, I don't really follow the news, but someone brought it up to me. And you just made me think about that. So um, let's talk about the, the the new project, right? You you you're taking this idea of you know story math and applying it to helping folks as they kind of prepare for maybe going public or exiting. I'd love to hear a little bit about this. Yeah, for sure. So we all know the power of story, or, or a lot of us know the power of story throughout the the life cycle of a company early on, whether it was the Kickstarter stuff, raising money, series A, series B, or while you're running the company to be able to tell a better story and sell more widgets and things like that. And what I realized is the most leveraged time, the most important story to tell about your business, if you're going to sell it, is when you sell or when you go public. And the people that you hire to help you do that are typically very good at the numbers. They're investment you know, bankers, brokers, et cetera who look at your all your financials and everything else do a confidential info memorandum cim and they put the package together the package is 90 percent numbers it's not stories and so why right. don't we tell a better story of who the company is today where they're going etc so the new thing is it's doing similar work to uh, the, to the work that i've always done but really coming in to a company and saying okay you're thinking about selling in six months or nine months Let's figure out how to tell the best story. Maybe it's sprucing up existing assets, but really telling the story of where you're going in order to get a few things, what I call the perfect exit, right? Perfect intro, perfect exit. Not just the best deal, because if you, you could sell for the max money, you, you know this, you could sell for the max amount of money, but if you sell to a horrible company that, you know, is going to treat you like crap or make you do things you don't want to do or whatever, it's not worth the extra money. So get right. the best money from the best person at the appropriate time. Cause timing is a big thing too. Right. And a lot of people wish they would have sold their company a year ago versus now. Um, and getting the terms that you want, basically like any sales, creating demand, creating, uh, a, whether it's a bidding war or more demand for the, the thing, but it's, we're wrapping a story around the numbers because everyone uses stories to, to market, to grow. You told stories to hire people. You told stories to get partners on board. They've been, so why do we stop telling stories when you go to sell the company? So that's really what the offering is. When someone starts to think about selling their company, we work with them to wrap a story around the numbers that helps them get the exit they want. I love that, man. And I think it's, it's so important. I was telling you before the show, I have a friend um, who was a former guest on the show, Rick Sapio, that's doing the exit concierge. So it's like the same idea. Like, how do you perfect that exit? How do you stick that landing? And to your point, like people buy, clarity and they buy stories or right? they're going to understand what they're buying and if you can package that up really well which it sounds like what you're doing i think that there's a ton of value opportunity there so listeners who are thinking of exiting i, I highly encourage you when we kind of get into the how to connect with clay stuff part of the show here at the end i, I, I highly recommend reaching out and connecting on that um, awesome you know here here at the greatness machine we loved it to really end our shows with, with with the question i call the greatness the question so do you want to play a greatness question and we'll get things wrapped up here yeah let's do it all right so clay what is the number one barrier to creating greatness that you've overcome in your life and how did you overcome it yeah so that is uh, first of all it's an excellent question i think the number one barrier that i've overcome is 
it was really being willing to fully leave Accenture, start over, do the Seth Godin program, knowing that everything was going to be a complete reboot, everything at zero, because um, it was scary. I was about a year and a half from making partner. And when you make partner wow. in a company like that, you get a bunch of salary, a bunch of whatever. And, but you also kind of get these golden handcuffs because they don't just give you a big thing on day one. It's stretched out over years. And I knew that if I didn't leave then, the, you know, the money and the compensation and the stock and everything else would be so good that I'd probably be there for the next 10 years. And then I wouldn't know you. I wouldn't be doing what I'd be doing. I wouldn't be doing perfect exit. I wouldn't love story math. And it was the hard decision to say no. And a bunch of my friends and family said, you know, you're, you're making a huge mistake. You're almost partner. This is what you've been doing for the last nine years. What, what are you doing? Throwing that all away. And I just knew that the, the new path. So it was, it was a tough thing at the time. And, um, to, to fully do it. A friend of mine had some really good advice. I was scared about fully leaving. And he said, tell you what, he goes in six months, if this new thing crashes, you can't get a client, you burn through all your savings. Do you think Accenture would have you back? And I was like, yeah, of course they would. He goes, then what's the problem? And that really cleared it up for yeah. me. So as people think about doing the hard thing, the pivot, you know, there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of, you know, fancy quotes about burning the ships and, oh, look, I burned the ships and blah, 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 blah. It's yeah. fine if, if you need that to commit to that. But often you don't need to burn the ships. Given the world, given the tools we all have access to, look at what you're doing with Riverside, the podcast, everything. Like all these tools are just out there for 20 bucks a month or free. You can do anything you want. You can launch anything you want. And you don't have to burn the ships. You can actually keep your day job and start your podcast at night. You can start your blog. You can start your Substack newsletter and sell it for a million dollars in two years. Anything is possible. The tools are almost free. Um, I almost made the mistake of saying, Oh, I'm going to go back to Accenture, you know, but, but my friend gave me good advice and I, I would leave that with the biggest thing for me was, was just uh, pulling that, pulling that ripcord and going. I love it, man. Such a great story. So, um, man, how can people connect with you? Let's give them kind of the whole rig and row and uh, I'll get you out of here, my friend. Yeah, for sure. So, my name is Clay Aber, and I'm Clay Aber everywhere online. But let's do this. I have lots of links. I got this link of like 50 plus book publishing and marketing links. And I love collecting and curating all these resources. I'm going to make a page at clayanddarius.com and just go back yeah. through the episode and anything we mentioned, the links, Seth's best stuff. If you listen to this and you're still listening, anything I mentioned plus a bunch of other free stuff, I'm going to link it up at clayanddarius.com and uh, that'll make it easy for them to go find it. Awesome, man. You're such a badass. Oh, uh, Clay, so much gratitude here for me Th to get to thank you. reconnect with you recently and now on the show. And uh, man, looking forward to us hanging out in Austin and uh, chopping it up. And um, thank you, man. A lot of gratitude. Appreciate thank you. you. This is the best. Really appreciate it, Darius. Thank you for all, everything you do. All right. So listeners, uh, as leaders, we're givers. Share this with anyone that needs to hear it. So many jewels here on marketing and how to show up and be your best self and present yourself in the right way and then and then some. And if you're exiting your company or you want someone to help you really tie things together, close your guys. So we'll make sure uh go to our new website. As I was going to say his, but it's ours since my name's yes. on it. Um, and uh, until next time, man, peace out. We love you guys. are listening to the greatness machine and that's a wrap for today listen if you love what you heard subscribe to the show on whatever podcast platform that you're tuning in on so that you don't miss any of our future episodes we have tons of great people coming on and we're, we're stoked to have you here to enjoy it with us leave us a review tell us what you love most about this particular episode we love getting the reviews we love to see what you guys love most and if this particular episode you know made you think of someone who's leveling up in their business and in their life print screen share it with them leaders are the best givers and after all we're all here to support and grow with each other and in case you want to see some of the fun behind the scenes shots or some of the things that we're doing i'm actually writing about this in my weekly newsletter go to www.therealdarius.com and subscribe to my newsletter we're talking about fun things like business and life and mindfulness and cryptocurrencies and gosh i don't even know everything and anything but it's tons of fun stuff i write about i try to get it out on a weekly basis you can subscribe at www.therealdarius.com and with that said look thank you guys so much i appreciate you i love you peace we're out of here see you guys on the next one uh -huh. she's my lover